This is the Australian arid zone, stretching over two thirds of the Australian continent. The arid zone is a vast land of hot days, cold nights and very little rainfall. It seems incredible to think that plants and animals are able to survive here, but many do. In fact, there are some groups that are so successful, there are more species found here than anywhere else on the planet. In October 2012, I joined a team of researchers from Macquarie University on a trip to Yathon Nature Reserve in central New South Wales. We wanted to find one particular group of animals that are amazingly successful in this region. These are the reptiles. Our goal was to examine the adaptations that have helped them colonise and thrive in these desert lands. So we're en route from Sydney to the Yathon Reserve. We've been travelling for about four hours, which gets us to the halfway point. And we've taken this opportunity to visit the beautiful Bornor Caves, which have these wonderful limestone structures. But for the reptiles, we need to go up top, because that's where all the reptile habitats are. This is a tree to tell it's a beautiful little gecko. You see it's got a flat body that allows it to live underneath the bark and find the insects and spiders and things that it feeds on. It's also got these little hands with pads on them like this that allow it to grip on to surfaces and so some geckos can actually hang upside down on the roof for instance. Okay. The other thing it's got you can see here it's got a big fat tail. Now geckos store fat in that tail. Sometimes though they can sacrifice these tails if they're being chased by a predator. They'll drop the end of the tail, the predator will eat that tail and the gecko will survive and grow a new tail. So we've also managed to catch a totally different type of reptile here. This is something known as a tenotus lizard and it's a member of the skink family you immediately see that it's different than the geckos. Well, Ted, you can see that this is a long, thin lizard. It's got a much longer tail than the gecko. And just like the gecko, you can see that this lizard has lost the end of its tail as well. So some kind of predator has had a go at this lizard in the past. It's lost the end of its tail, lived to survive, and grown that tail anew. So what type of predators would this reptile be hiding from in amongst the rocky crevices? They'd be snakes, birds of prey, maybe even humans. After a few more hours of driving, we arrived at Yathon Nature Reserve, which will be our home for the next 10 days. The climate here is very different from where I live in Sydney, and I could instantly feel the dry heat sapping my energy, but the reptiles are much happier here than me. Reptiles are ectothermic, which means that they can't generate their own body heat. So they use the desert sun to warm up their bodies, which are covered in scales to help minimise water loss. Nevertheless, the arid zone is still a very harsh and challenging environment in which to live, and I was looking forward to learning about some of the other adaptations reptiles possess that enable them to survive out here. So we're here in Yathon Reserve in central New South Wales. This area represents the largest Mallee woodland in all of Australia. Hopefully by now you can see that the deserts aren't devoid of vegetation, they're actually this complex mosaic of habitat. And for this reason, they hold exceptional levels of biodiversity. And we're gonna be showing you this over the next couple of days. Our search for reptiles began around the property in which we were staying. And it wasn't long before we found many signs of life. So each morning here at the Yathon Reserve, just around the property, we've been looking for signs of life. And even here, just on the back steps, we've been lucky enough to find this spotted grass frog. Even though we're in Arizona, Australia, it's in some of the driest locations, we can still actually find amphibians here. So 
So all this um, rubbish is still really good habitat for reptiles? Yeah, it is. Lift up the tin, just be careful of snakes, yeah? Okay. Hey Michael, I've managed to find a shingleback lizard. Do you mind taking a look? Yeah, I've got a central dragon here. They're very um, different looking lizards, aren't they? Yeah, I've got the same triangular head, big gape, but different scales. Yeah, they're huge on here. Are they, um, they provide any function for it? Yeah, these are big armour plated scales that provide protection against predators. And you can also see that both of these lizards have scales that protect them against the drying winds that we're standing in now, yeah? Do you know anything about the tails? Because this one looks like it's been broken or, or is that actually a natural tail? No, that's the normal tail and that tail imitates the head of the lizard so that a predator might go for this end instead of this end and the lizard lives to fight another day. I also found a group of geckos hiding under some other bits of rubbish. They were really easy to catch because it was early and they hadn't had a chance to warm up in the sun. Hey Michael, I've managed to find a whole bunch of geckos out the back there of the property. Oh, what have you got there, Ted? Uh, this looks like an adult barking gecko. Isn't she beautiful? Uh, one thing I also noticed when I caught them was they were really cold this morning to touch. Yeah, well, reptiles are cold-blooded. That's one of the reasons why they do so well in the arid zone, because there's not much food, so they can just keep cold and hibernate, more or less, and they don't have to spend a lot of energy keeping their bodies warm. From the geckos we saw the other day, their feet are very different. Yeah, these guys have very long fingers with claws on the end of them, you see that? And these guys, if we let them go, would actually stand up on their, on their legs and walk around, because they live on the ground instead of climbing trees and surfaces. Okay, so the long legs are just another adaptation to where they live? Yep. So I really wanted you to also look at this other gecko. It looks um, a lot pale in the other one, but I think it's the same species. Yeah, it is the same species. It's just about to shed its skin. So when that white skin comes off, it'll look like just like this other juvenile one here. So up until now, we've actually been doing all of our reptile catching by hand. We've been doing it in the early morning when it's very cold and the reptiles are very slow. But now the sun's at its height, it's very hot, the reptiles are gonna be very warm and moving very fast. So what we need is a system to actually try and catch these reptiles for us and make it a lot easier. So hopefully Abby will explain this pitfall trap system to us. Hey. Hello. Yeah, so this is a pitfall trap. It's effectively a bucket that's just been uh, dug into the ground. And what we hope is gonna happen is that the lizards will run up to this drift fence um, and they can't get through obviously, so they'll turn to the left or the right and they'll fall into a bucket for us. So I don't have to do anything to catch a <laughs> reptile? No, you don't, we just leave them and see what happens. Fantastic. We might catch things other than lizards obviously, so we'll probably catch quite a few insects. Um, and if we're really lucky, we might even catch a small mammal. Okay, so we just come back tonight or in the morning and we should have something in the buckets. Let's hope so. Great news. It's a gecko. Yeah. One of the ones we've seen before, is this a new one? I don't think one? so, I think this is a new species. Oh, oh, isn't he the cutest little gecko? Definitely a juvenile. Yeah, it's a little knobtail gecko. That's <laughs> a really appropriate name, look at that. Yeah, it is. Look at the size of his eyes as well. Really? Wow. Okay, so this is an absolutely beautiful little marsupial mouse that we've caught in the traps, and you can tell um, that he's a marsupial mouse because of his pointy face. We left all the traps open to do their job and decided to take a drive to see what else we could find. So along this fence line here, just keep your eye on the big wooden fence posts because at this time of day, the dragons are gonna be sitting on top sunning themselves. What they're gonna be doing is warming themselves up for tonight when they're going to go hunting for insects. And because they've warmed themselves up during the day, they'll be able to stay warm on into the evening to catch more prey. 
and I guess they stake out their own little sunning post on the side of the uh, road here because they have pear trees. That's a beautiful lizard. Yeah, I can feel the heat coming off him actually Let in my hand feel. as well. Oh yeah, he's much, much warmer. He's almost body heat, isn't he? Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah very similar temperature. So that's to me, I think. just from sitting in the sun. He's picked up enough energy to be the same temperature that we are. Whereas the lizard that we caught the other morning was stone cold, wasn't it? Yeah, and, and not, it and could not hardly move. Sure. Yeah. Whereas this one's really frisky. Yeah. Beautiful lizard, though. Our next stop was the local rubbish tip. There are lots of places for reptiles to hide here. Here, right? That's main body, All right? Cool. Yep. You hear him hissing? Yep. You try and get his tail out first. Yep. And then I can kind of work it a bit there. It's decent yeah. size, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. There we go. There we cool, go. cool, cool, cool. Okay, hold, stay. All right. All right. So I can move this. Yep. Yep. Cool. And perfect capture. Yeah. So we've been lucky enough to actually catch this beautiful carpet python, and he's probably about four foot long. And although he's actually pretty calm at the moment, you can see he's very comfortable with us holding him. But despite that, you can still feel the real strength in some of these coils. And this is actually how it immobilizes its prey. The scales are actually a really grayish color over that beautiful pattern. And that's because it's about to shed its skin like all reptiles do. Also, you may have noticed this snake is actually flicking its tongue out. And it uses that to actually sense its environment. And it will actually be able to taste its prey um, just so it knows which area to move to to actually do its hunting. So, tail, yeah, tail first, so we get his body weight and then we're just dropping it the last moment and he's in. So yeah. Can't go under. Yeah, hook him back this way. Let yeah. him go. I think you got him. Yeah. And just gently, gently, gently. Yeah. Just yeah. watch that. So go with the tail yeah. first. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. yep. Cool. Okay. All right. So we've just caught a second python here. And this one has a big bulge in it. That's where the uh, previous meal is at the moment. And how often do you think they take a meal this size? Well, because snakes are cold-blooded, they actually don't need much food. And so maybe once a month he might get a big mammal or something like that, yeah? So we're just going to release this guy now. And a pair of snakes wasn't all we found. Hey Ted, how'd you go? So yeah, we've got a couple of new species of reptiles to look at here. Yeah, have a look at these, mate. Thanks. Oh yeah, it looks like we've got two juvenile desert skinks here. Okay, this is the other lizard I've got. It's a beautiful, shiny and stripy lizard. Yeah, that's a sand swimmer. So this lives in the same kind of environment as the desert skink? Yeah, this is a burrower, but this one actually swims through the sand like it was a liquid. Okay. And it's got this pointy head to help do that, and you'll feel all of the scales are really smooth. And that allows it to move freely through the sand. And the head shape, that's very different to yours. Yeah, very different. Okay, Ted, what I've got here is a larista. Beautiful. And you'll see how long and thin these are like a snake. So this is when lizards take the burrowing lifestyle a step further, and eventually species that do this lose their front legs and become like a snake. Okay, here's this beautiful carpet python that we caught earlier. I remember when we were talking about that it was just about to shed his skin because he was a totally different colour. You can now see that since we've had him in the bag, he's actually started to shed. And that beautiful vibrant colour of the carpet python starting to come out again. Now, is there anything majorly different between this snake, apart from the size, and that little skink you've got there? Okay, so the smallest skink and the largest snake face to face. So there is evidence that the snake ones had legs. They've got tiny little femurs like your big leg bone that are left on a pelvic girdle. And the only thing that you can see is the little scale down the very end of the snake. And this little guy here is on the way to doing that. So the Larista is a skink that has gradually lost its limbs over evolutionary time. And this limb loss makes it better adapted to a burrowing lifestyle. Living underground is common among desert reptiles because it allows them to escape from the sun during the hottest parts of the day. It wasn't long before we found another strange looking lizard that has taken this adaptation one step further. Ted, you remember the other day we were talking about how skinks lose their legs when they start to burrow over evolutionary time? Well, this is an example of that taken to extreme. This is a spinifex snake lizard and you can see it looks like a snake 
We can tell it's a lizard though because it's got ear holes and if you look carefully you can also see little stubs where the rear limbs used to be. And there are even snakes that are adapted to the burrowing lifestyle. So this is a beautiful little prong-snouted blind snake that we caught last night. And in this animal, the evolution of the snakes has proceeded one step further. He lives underground and you can see that his eyes have been reduced to tiny little dots on his head. And we may be able to see that he's a snake when he flicks his tongue out and you'll see that it's a forked tongue just like the other snakes we've been looking at. And it's not just the reptiles that like to live under rubbish. Even professors need a little peace and quiet sometimes. I suppose the reptiles just see the rubbish as great habitat, which allows them to hide from predators and shelter from the sun. But there are other, more natural habitats, such as underneath the bark of trees, which can also provide reptiles with refuge. Okay, so they're actually in here. There's two Agurnia striolata. They're both juveniles, so likely to be born this year. One's gone that way now. We'll see if we can actually get the second one for you to go. Come down. Do you want me to I do actually have him. Come, come, Michael, if you can grab your hand in here now. This side of me, this side of me. Oh, I've yeah. got him pinned. Yeah. I just need to okay. grab his head. Oh, 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 there he goes. Oh, he's gone down. Stay there, stay there, stay. Going, going down. He's already gone. Already gone this way. Cool. Yep, got him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we finally got him. Yeah, we did. Cool. So this is a common tree skink? Yeah, it's an agurnia. So these guys live with each other for about a year, is that right? Yeah, that's right. And um, the actual parents do tolerate them in the nest for quite a while. So very close around here somewhere, we're likely to find the parents. In terms of size, they'd probably be oh, at least twice as long as this, but certainly more robust as well. Uh, so I reckon if the juveniles have outsmarted us, there's no chance we're going to get the adults. No, definitely. We only got one out of two, so the adults are easily going to outsmart us. But sometimes the lizards are simply too big to catch and it is much safer for us to just stand back and admire these beautiful creatures. So it's late in the afternoon and we're about two to three meters up a tree, but we've been lucky enough to find a lace monitor. It's just sitting in the top of the branches here. Now this is the largest lizard we're likely to find in this region of Arizona, Australia, and it's the apex predator in this region. This lizard is capable of taking down small lizards and all the way through up to anything the size of a small wallaby. It also uses these massive claws that it has to actually break into termite mounds. And although it doesn't have any predators of its own, it uses trees like this when it feels threatened, just so it can get some height to feel safe again. And it is truly one of the most magnificent reptiles we're likely to find around here. Not all reptiles are able to climb trees and so need to find other ways to fend off predators. So while we were out driving this morning to go and check the traps, we actually found these two species of lizards basking at the side of the road. The one in the right hand, this is the shingleback, and the one in my left hand is a species we haven't seen until today. This is the blue tongue. Now because they're very closely related, they do have some similarities, but they also have some obvious differences. The shingleback has these very big armory scales, so it doesn't really have a need to run. It can actually protect itself when attacked. Now there's a bit of a trade-off for the blue tongue. It has a lot smaller scales, so it's more vulnerable to predator attack. But because of this, it can run a lot faster. So this is just another example of a wonderful adaptation between two very closely related species. And if I let them go now, hopefully we'll be able to see the difference in the speed that they'll run away from me. The traps were working their magic and catching lots of reptiles for us. We caught a marsupial mouse, a knob-tailed gecko, a barking gecko that uses its tail to store fat for when food supplies are scarce, a spiny-tailed gecko which uses the spines along the tail to exude a distasteful substance that help it escape when predators try to eat it, and a box-patterned gecko. The pattern on its back helps break up the outline of the body, giving it excellent camouflage amongst the leaf litter. We also caught a species of gecko that none of us had seen before. So it was time to get out our reptile identification books. Okay guys, these um, last geckos we got from the Malian Spinifex pitfall traps, we still need to ID. Okay, so it's definitely not the prickly gecko, the binos, because it's smooth. Oh yeah. Yep. And the two geckos that we know are in the area are the beaked gecko 
and the beaded gecko. And that pattern's really similar, actually. Yeah, yeah. it is similar. Yeah, it is. And the rim of the upper eyelid is white, which it is. Yep. Okay, so I think that's what we've got. We might have a winner. Bearded um, gecko. And looking by the size, this is actually fully grown. Yep. Yeah. Four to five centimetres. All right, so this is girl, this one here. Mm. Uh, and Abby's Abby. got the male. It clearly has a male. Boy. I can yeah. see that from here. <laughs> so that's another species to add to our list. The next day was particularly hot, and on days like these, many desert animals will seek out shade to cool down. This is an example of a behavioural adaptation, which is when animals act in a certain way that helps them survive in their environment. We've just managed to find another lace monitor. We were actually just driving back to the, the Ethon Reserve buildings because it's middle of the day, it's really hot, it's actually very hot for us to work in, and also it's not usually very productive to find reptiles. They can actually get too hot here in the desert. And this is exactly what this guy is doing now. He's avoiding the heat. He's crawled into this very dense bushland and he's found a really good patch of shade just so he can actually cool down a little bit and miss the heat of the day. He'll probably stay here for a couple of hours until the late afternoon. And at that stage, he'll be on the move again and he'll be foraging. So we've been really lucky to find this magnificent reptile. And when animals aren't sheltering from the midday sun or out foraging for food, they may be out looking for a mate. So we've just stopped at the side of the road here because we found a pair of shingleback lizards. Now this is a really beautiful story. When these guys become of reproductive age, they'll find a partner, they'll mate, and at the end of that breeding season they may separate, but every season after that they'll always find each other to breed again. They're faithful between years, so it's one of the most beautiful love stories in the reptile world. On our final day, we struck gold, a sangoana. Lucky that he ran into that log. I can see him here. It's going to be a handful to get out. All right, we're going to block this off. All right. We need to block this end as well. Where is he? Oh, here he is. He's right yeah, here. Yeah, I can see. I'm just yeah, going to see where his head goes to. We can put the yeah. snake bag over everything. All right, that's so. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're good. All right, we're slide, good. slide out, yeah? Yep. Yep. Cool. Keep hold of it tight, tight, yeah. tight. Yep, I've got it. I've got it. Righto. Okay, lift up. He's not going to jump out. Yep. Okay. Yep. I'm so excited today because we've actually finally managed to capture a sanguana. Despite all reptiles being cold-blooded, they can be exceptionally fast. Remember these guys, they're actually really good predators. They will take on very small rodents, but mainly they live off um, insects, a lot of spiders as well. They'll tunnel into the spider holes with these very powerful claws, which I'm going to try and avoid because they're really sharp. And then this long neck helps them get down into those deep holes. The other thing we also mentioned, and hopefully you'll be able to see it now, is this tongue flick. All goannas have forked tongues, and they use this to sense their environment. Well, this has been such a magical experience for me, but it's time to let this guy go back into the wild and um, hopefully we'll see some more of them. I remember my first trip to the outback, and ever since then I've just always wanted to come back. And I don't know what it is about being out here. Part of it is the fact that it's absolutely glorious, just the scenery, I mean the colours are absolutely stunning. It's also like the isolation as well, so far from civilization. It's such a lovely change from Sydney. We're actually surrounded by so much life out here. I think there's this misconception that the outback of Australia is like the dead centre of Australia. So the reason I love the desert ecosystems is because they're so isolated and they're so unique. I mean you, you get these really confronting conditions at times and they can be really extreme but to balance that there's this hidden beauty and diversity everywhere just if you're willing to spend the time to look. I feel so privileged to have been part of this trip and I would encourage everyone to actually come and visit this region at least once in their lives because the Australian arid zone, it's a true wonder of our natural world. So it's interesting to think that most Australians cling to that narrow coastal strip between Brisbane and Melbourne. And we ignore the arid interior of Australia even though it makes up the majority of this vast continent. I guess people ignore the arid zones because they think of them as dry and lifeless. But as I hope you've seen, this is a beautiful landscape and it's full of an amazing diversity of plants and animals. That's what brings me back time and time again, and I hope it'll bring you out here too.
We've been living in the Yathong Reserve for 12 days now, and unfortunately it's time for us to head back to Sydney. In the short period of time that we've been focusing on the reptile or biodiversity, we've been able to show you 25 different species. But there's also amazing diversity amongst the amphibians, the birds, the mammals, the plants and the invertebrates here. So I hope that we've gone some way to actually correct the misconception that the deserts are lifeless, because it couldn't be further from the truth. This region actually represents the largest ecosystem we have in Australia. It covers 70% of the landmass. We're all extremely passionate about conserving this area, and I now hope that you are too.